이야기 들어보도록 하겠습니다. 박수 부탁드립니다. 어, 오케이. 안녕하세요. Is that correct? Okay, all right. Um, I actually know another one. Uh, 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 let me see. Okay. Uh, uh, Josayo, uh, I have no idea what I just said. Uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, this is actually the barely, uh, this is actually my first time in Seoul. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's great to have some friends here from Nance and from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ethereum uh, in Korea uh, to host me here. And um, I'm so glad that I have the opportunity to talk about our technology here. This is actually not, not the first time that Seller Network talk about the uh, our technology and the progress in Korea. This is actually the second time. The first time we talked a lot about our technology itself, uh, but this time I'm gonna first share a little bit about what we have been doing in terms of actual adoption and uh, in terms of our testnet launches, that some interesting statistics that, that we uh, found and uh, uh, analyzed. And then I'm also gonna jump a little bit into some of the technology details. Uh, and uh, our, our first uh, speaker, Damsong? Um, uh, uh, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, he actually had a very, very good introduction about the uh, state channel. So uh, it, it saves a lot of about like uh, saves my uh, you know time a lot uh, in terms of the actual introduction. So uh, let's jump into this. Uh, Stellar network is a layer two uh, scaling construct, and uh, you know as you uh, have been hearing about this whole night that we are inserting one layer in between the decentralized application and also the blockchain. Now, what exactly is Stellar Network? It consists of two parts. One is the, the technology part called C-Stack, uh, which is itself a layered technology architecture uh, with C-Channel, which is uh, providing the capability to do generalized state channel and the generalized layer two scaling, um, not only just like simple payment or simple application, and then on top of the C channel, there is a C route, which is, you can think of that as a, the performance engine of the state channel network. So it makes the state channel um, you know, extremely fast in terms of routing the payment or routing the generalized payment. And then on top of that, we have COS, which is effectively an operating system layer or a API or SDK layer that is finally facing the application um, and uh, you know, uh, stuff that it's building up. Now, Besides the technology construct, we also have the first uh, uh, ever uh, layer two crypto economic constructs, uh, including liquidity backing auction and the proof of liquidity committed to mining and the state guardian networks. So, uh, you know, what, what is the crypto economics? It is basically uh, incentive designs to solve critical challenges uh, uh, in the crypto economics or blockchain systems. Uh, in layer two, in layer one, the, the crypto economics is basically the consensus layer, right? So how do you achieve consensus among different nodes? But in layer two, there are also very important crypto economics uh, problems that need to be solved. And specifically in generalized state channel network, uh, there are problems about how to make sure that the off-chain state is always available for on-chain dispute, for on-chain potential dispute, and also how to solve the data connectivity issue where like someone might be offline during the interaction of the state channel, and then thirdly, how to obtain enough liquidity to actually run a state channel as a state channel operator. So these questions, we actually propose a holistic solution to solve these things. Um, but before we go into that, we actually have launched our test net, and uh, our main net is coming very soon. It's coming like in two months. And uh, on top of Ethereum, we already achieved about 20,000 times faster uh, finality latency uh, because like, you know, this, this number is kind of a marketing-ish because, uh, you know, the uh, state channel is uh, like instant final versus, uh, uh, you know, the probabilistic finality pro uh, provided by the underlying Ethereum. And uh, uh, you know we have off-chain smart contract support, uh, fully support, and we also proposed the uh, or released the first mobile wallet support off-chain scaling, um, and uh, you know all these other things. And we we are actually a uh, multi-blockchain support uh, uh, construct. We support both EVM construct and uh, as well as uh, web assembly based construct. So uh, you know on on we are not only focusing on the technology itself. 
uh, we, we, we do focus a lot on the technology innovation itself. We are actually the first one to propose the generalized state channel, or to propose a generalized state channel um, specification. But we also focus very much on user adoption, the user application. So this is the Cedar X that we recently released as a user accessing platform towards the Cedar network testnet. And on this platform, what you can do is you can just like do this kind of things. So, uh, oh, okay, so this is, a, uh, this is like a screen recording. You can actually download the Seller uh, X at SellerX.app, A-P-P. Um, and uh, you know, this is just some very, very simple demonstration about sending uh, some token instantly uh, to your like, friends. And uh, as you can see, this is implemented in, in, on state channel, so the, the sending process is ex extremely fast. Now, the interesting part is this. So you're playing with your friend a Gomuko game, like basically five in a row. You connect the five stones in a row and you win. Um, and, um, you know, um, and, and at the same time, you're playing with your friend with like a GT token. What is GT token? It's a ERC20 token we issued on the Robson network. So you can replace that with like any kind of a stable token of your choice. Right, so uh, now you're basically betting the game with your friend. Now, note that this, in the beginning of the game, what, what happened really is that you send each other a conditional payment off chain. This entire application, there's no server, it's, it's fully decentralized. It is, it's just in the beginning you send each other a conditional payment, and that conditional payment is conditionally depending on the result of the game. And the game itself, is implemented as a generalized smart contract, a generalized state channel smart contract. So the entire execution process of the game is also entirely trust free. And uh, as you can see from the interaction, the, the interaction or interactiveness of the application is much, much better comparing to if we directly implement this on the blockchain itself. And uh, there's kind of another like a uh, uh, quick demo here. Uh, we actually are releasing something called the Sailor X platform, and it's basically built on top of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 th this application. But what it is is a very targeted game game facing or game developer facing platform, so that game developers who are very good at developing these kind of very small games can actually harvest the power of blockchain and generate sustainable monetization flows. So if, you, if there's any game developers in the audience today, definitely talk to us. Um, we are, we're extremely excited to looking forward to this kind of uh, uh, independent game studios. As uh, you know, for, for the, if, you, if, if we look at the 2018 and 2017, people have been focusing on uh, technology advancement, but not so much on the real adoption and uh, uh, real usage of blockchain technology. But we think that this kind of a platform is building and leveraging the power of layer two, but also create real business opportunities for small game developers. So there is one kind of a business model in the uh, you know, United States called skill-based real cash gaming. Uh, it's entirely legal in 38 different states. So basically this kind of game that you can actually play for real money with your friend. And uh, you know, imagine if you're a game developer and you build some game on top of a Seller network. And uh, this game is extremely popular and a lot of play people are playing and also like, uh, you know, exchanging money, with, uh, exchanging money um, you know, during the process. And uh, during that process, you actually can run a seller full node yourself and join the seller network so your users are basically routing their payments, their conditional payments through you. And uh, during that process, you're directly generating revenue uh, by just like having real transactions on top of a seller network. So, uh, you know, uh, we believe that this is like an extremely viable use case and we're gonna release this, uh, app, uh, this platform so that no more game developers who has no idea about how to use blockchain or how to interact with blockchain can take an existing HTML5 game and integrate it with Stellar under 20 minutes. So, we have released a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, uh, testnet. We released the first version of the testnet, which is like this, uh, this horse-like thing, uh, you know, uh, last year. And we recently released this dog-like thing. This is actually our office dog, um, you know, pretty recently. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, features supported that we supported, like multi-node non-cost audio payment, that generalized payment network that can support this kind of a conditional payment functionality. And uh, uh, we have generalized state channel support and all that stuff. So I'm gonna skip this because it's too long. 
Very simple question, why should developer care? Right, there are so many features. Well, because of this. Um, one application, which is the, the Gomoho game you guys just, uh, you guys just saw, uh, achieved uh, you know, 50 times user growth in just three months. And it, it, it started from like uh, 300 or 500 people uh, playing this uh, in a monthly basis, uh, reaches uh, very recently about 18,000 people that is actually actively playing on the game. And um, uh, the power of blockchain is really shown here because from our backend, we are monitoring like w where are our users coming from, right? So uh, it, 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 where our users are coming from actually 88 different, 88 different countries. And interestingly, we also have five users from Madagascar. So I'm, 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 a, I'm seriously considering host a meetup there as well. <laughs> So uh, now this is some interesting statistics, and if you guys have any question, I can you know reveal more about our interesting statistics here as well. But like uh, you know, uh, currently uh, we are what we are seeing from this application is that it doesn't look like your you know garden variety of a decentralized application where there is no user retention, there is no active user, user generate do not engage with the application for too long. This number, these numbers look, at, look like a real, um, real application, like real mobile applications number. So we have a day summary retention of 20%, 12 minutes of data user engagement time, and over one month we, we processed about 4 million off-chain transactions. So this is really happening, and we are running the largest scale uh, generalized state channel network in the world right now. And uh, you know, um, uh, from our users' feedback, what we learn is that okay, Center X is actually better US, uh, as if there's no blockchain. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, good words uh, talking about us. However, I want to actually be very clear here is that um, you know, uh, this is a kind of a, all these feedbacks are uh, are coming from like a uh, you know kind of a developer community. But if we shift the focus to a broader user space to like people who has no previous experience on top of blockchain, uh, you know, all these kind of a bubble, uh, you know, uh, 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 positive feedback start to collapse. Um, because layer two scaling platform is actually introducing additional layer of onboarding friction comparing to layer one blockchain. If you're just like, imagine that you just start to understand, oh, now I have this address, so I can hold this token and all that stuff. But now you're saying that you want me to de deposit this token to some other kind of smart contract to join Seller Network. Does that mean that a Seller Network actually holds our, uh, my token? Does that mean Seller Network is a centralized solution? These kind of questions start to pop up very quickly from our user. And uh, this is like uh, what's what bothering us right now and we're uh, trying to educate the user and educate the market to uh, solve these kind of questions. Now, this is just a reminder that this is just one application on a paper money testnet. Like the, all, the, all the tokens flowing in this network is a game token that we, we printed out that game token basically. Uh, and uh, however, we believe that this kind of a smooth interaction enabled by the generalized state channel technology can actually uh, create a high transaction volume and therefore provide the first or one of the first, uh, one of the first few uh, sustainable monetization paths for developers building on top of a blockchain ecosystem. Because if you think about it today, if you look at Tron, if you look at EOS, you look at all these uh, uh, you know, ecosystems, or e um, you know, uh, Ethereum, not, ex not exactly, but many of the new, uh, newly rising like, ecosystems are basically subsidizing their developers. They're paying the developers to build some application. Because when the developer build this application, there's no clear monetization path, or very, very simple monetization path. But for this, um, you know, because of the high transaction volume, hosting Seller Network uh, node actually makes sense. And uh, you know, uh, build application and hosting Seller Network node actually generate uh, income flow. And we have released a bunch of SDKs and there are a lot of uh, application being built on top of the Seller Network right now. Um, you know, uh, this part I'm gonna just uh, skip. So uh, we are mostly based in the United States. Uh, we recently just opened our Shanghai office. This is like, a, this, this graph is a three months old. We haven't got everyone's headshot yet. Um, so we have about 30 people right now. Um, you know, um, these are some of the back, team's background and we have uh, uh, about 34 million in bank. Uh, you know, uh, so we are very serious about this, um, you know, uh, to make the blockchain adoption real. Um, 
Okay, uh, so what's not, let me just briefly talk about what's next for us. Well, what's next for us, first thing is that we're gonna launch on mainnet very soon. And another thing is that, you know, when we look at all these layer two scaling technologies, we look at, uh, you know, zero knowledge proof, you can use that as a kind of a scaling uh, architecture. Now, uh, we look at the state channel, you look at all sorts of side chains, including plasma, and then interactive computing. All of them are just the technology pieces. Uh, and uh, our like kind of a grand vision, or uh, we think that a grand challenge to propose to the entire community is that these kind of uh, individual technologies should not form their own single solution. They should somehow work together and c provide a coherent solution because they are actually creating different trade-off points in the trade-off plane, in a very complicated trade-off plane, right? So for example, a state channel is really good, good for this kind of interactive applications, but if you have a large amount of participants in the application, this actually does not work. So you might actually consider using Plasma EVM, for example. So, um, but you know, plus the EVM, I, as uh, we just like talk, ch chat about, like a, um, you know, offline, uh, you know, has long finite delays. So there is kind of a, in, um, you know, kind of a trade-off curve here that we want to explore that trade-off curve so that whatever application scenario arises, we can actually find the suitable solution or suitable technology under this coherent solution. So that's where we are pushing the community forwards. And of course, we are releasing our set of acts pretty soon. Um, you know, uh, these are some of the channels that you guys can follow us. Um, so that's kind of like a very, very quick introduc introduction about the uh, setters, uh, uh, you know, where we are in terms of the technology. Let me check the time here. Okay, I, I, I still have some time. Can I like switch the slides a little bit? Yeah. All right, so uh, you know uh, I'm gonna skip part of the, the part of the technology part because like uh, you know that's kind of demonstrated by the application or uh, you know uh, technology itself. Uh, but now what I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, the crypto economic construct. <clears throat> so there are several problems or challenges that need to be solved uh, in layer two scaling because layer two scaling is uh, making everything super fast, but it is also trading off something else. Uh, especially for generalized uh, state channel, uh, the first trade-off is the how to make off-chain always available, off-chain state always available for on-chain dispute. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, just uh, you know, tagging along with uh, the first, uh, the great first talk is that, that talks a, a lot about this stuff already. Even though I don't understand like uh, Korean, I'm, I'm using Google Translate to you know follow the, the talk actually. Uh, and uh, you know, let's say Alice and Bob is like doing some state exchange. This is an extremely simple one-hop payment channel. Right, so now you have the current state as the 49, number 49. And then Bob goes offline. Uh, Alice here can turn malicious and submit a older state proof to the on-chain bond contract. And uh, then what happens is like after the challenge period, um, you know, basically Alice is gonna get like more dollar than uh, she should have, right? So. Uh, what, what, uh, how do we solve this? On chain, uh, centralized monitoring solution is definitely not a good choice because like, it creates immediate incentive problem of collusion. And uh, what about trust-free monitoring? There are uh, some researchers proposing trust-free monitoring. How it works is basically like this. Like this. Um, you, know, uh, you have Bob submit the current state to, the, to, a, state, uh, to a watchtower service, and the watchtower service is also putting down some money on chain. It's kind of like an honesty bond that you know, if I do not do the job, you can take my money. Um, and uh, what's gonna happen is that if Alice is like a turn malicious, uh, this watchtower service should be guarding the state for the user. And if not, user can later come back online and prove to that smart contract who is holding like some uh, you know, kind of a uh, honesty bond that this watchtower didn't do the job and then take the money. But this trust-free monitoring service also has significant disadvantages, including it doubles the overall liquidity lockup of this entire network, uh, because now you need to not only having this uh, kind of a channel operator lockup money, but also the, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the monitoring services uh, also need to lock up money. 
and it creates very heterogeneous interfaces for state guarding because uh, you know sometimes you, know, you it's very hard to even reason what is the value underlying a particular state, and it's created a very obscure and expensive pricing model for these kind of services, and created extremely complex on-chain and off-chain interaction. For every kind of a state guarding request, you need to incur certain kind of on-chain uh, on-chain transaction cost. And in the end of the day, what it really provides is a very, very rigid insurance model. You basically get X percent back for Y price, and that's it. Um, you know, as long as X percent is not 100 percent, you always suffer from this collusion attack potential. So, how do we solve this? We propose something called the uh, state guardian network, which is a special kind of sidechain with plasma-like semantics. So you stake your uh, seller token into this uh, state guardian network sidechain and become a state guardian. And when user goes offline or when periodically you user want to checkpoint the state, the user will just submit the state proof to this uh, state guardian network, submit a hash of the state proof actually. And uh, a state proof here can be really anything. It can be a game state, it can be a signed agreement, it can be auction acknowledgement. It, it, it provides a very, very homogeneous uh, interface for the user. Now, the immediate question to ask is that then how many state guardian will be guarding for your state, right? Well, that is determined by the payment. So let's say this user, Bob here, is paying like $1 per hour for this, to this entire network to guard, to guard the state. And at the same time, there are other people paying the network as well. Let's say this entire network is, is receiving $2 per hour as payment income flow. Now, Bob is constituting half of the income flow, and therefore, roughly about half of the state's guardian will be guarding the state for Bob. So it's basically proportional to the income flow you generated to the, to the network versus the, the overall, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, overall like income flow generated by, uh, received by the network. And of course, you know, if you stake more seller token, uh, what's gonna happen is that you basically get assigned with more work, statistically speaking, and therefore receive more payment. So seller token here becomes like a work authorization token, so that if you stake your seller, you do the work, you receive income. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the, we, we also have a built inclusion resistance system where uh, the, the state guardians are randomly selected, and each of the state guardian will be assigned with the dispute slot. So if the malicious uh, uh, user comes online and do the kind of a, a dispute, and let's say guardian number two is also a bad guy here, and uh, what's gonna happen is that uh, uh, guardian number three can respond to this uh, uh, you know, uh, malicious settlement and uh, also like, submit the correct state, uh, state proof. And at the same time, he will be able to prove that guardian number two didn't do his job and get guardian number two's token to him. So it basically effectively kicked guardian number two out of the uh, out of this entire state guardian group. Now, a very, very valid question to ask is that, okay, what happens if number two, number three, and number four, they're all malicious? What's gonna happen then? Well, uh, that becomes kind of the last resort, that it, when the user later comes back online, he can submit, because of the, the, the plasma semantic of this kind of a state guardian network, uh, there is a, the capability to attribute a history um, you know, uh, uh, pretty accurately. So uh, the Bob can actually pr have a proof of malicious behavior submitted to the state guardian network and uh, let the, the entire uh, you know, tokens staked on behalf of him uh, be compensated to himself. So all these state guardian uh, will be kicked out of the network. Now, that creates a very, very interesting economic dynamic here because what is one seller token? One seller token represents an income flow if you do the work. So now, uh, depending on what did Bob pay in the very beginning, uh, you know, the more, the, the, uh, the more Bob pays, uh, the, the more number of seller token will be guarding or responsible for Bob's estate. And uh, you know, basically, the potential loss will be recovered faster because like, let's say, 
Bob can like stake his own Seder token into the system and start to earn income flow as well. So now it creates an insurance not against a certain hard and fixed number. It creates an insurance against a certain kind of a income flow. And how each individual evaluate, evaluate or value the income flow can be drastically different. And that opens a very, very flexible uh, you know, market dynamics here. And uh, uh, you know uh, that is uh, uh, something about like uh, the state guardian network. And uh, uh, the second thing is like connectivity challenge. Uh, in state channel network, you always have this case where like you're about to win. Let's say you know you're about to win the chess, and you submit the uh, you pass the, the winning state proof to your opponent, and your opponent just like goes away. Okay. So can we just let IS directly submit it to complain on the blockchain saying that, oh, my opponent uh, just went away? Can, can we let the uh, IS do that? Well, no. Because uh, you know, blockchain cannot really differentiate between these three scenarios. The first is that Bob is really not responding. And the second is that Alice just like uh, you know kind of maliciously saying that oh Bob is not responding, but actually Bob is like fully responding. And it can also be that it's not of their fault. It's just like the network connection between them is not available right now. So we need a uh, fallback data exchange fabric that is uh, reasonably available, has attribution of uh, availability time, and is extremely cost effective and does not require large amount of resources from the end users. Uh, you know, we can use blockchain as a data availability service. Basically, meaning that if you're passing the data to your opponent and your opponent does not respond, you just pass that data also on the blockchain, assuming that everyone has reasonable access, uh, accessibility to the blockchain itself. But uh, you know, it, it, it is definitely not not not. Uh, I mean, it's definitely not like a. Uh, you know, cheap because like you're actually storing the state to the blockchain, and also uh, it's uh, definitely not like uh, you know uh, a resource uh, uh, conserving because it actually requires own monitoring of this entire blockchain states to make sure that your opponent is not maliciously submitting a state uh, to the block. Now, what, what do we, how do we solve that? Is to, to use uh, uh, again uh, the state guardian network as a data availability service. Um, it is reasonably available. It uh, has attribution of uh, availability time. That's no problem. Um, you know, the on-chain st uh, state uh, storage is also very cheap because um, you know you're only storing the, the storage in a temporary time. So because of the state guardian's nature, every state state stored in the state guardian network has a timeout associated with it. Uh, so you know, in the end of the day, uh, you know, the state stored in the state guardian network will be only become a hash versus. Uh, uh, a time, uh, and a timeout value. And it, it actually requires only O uh, log N monitoring. Uh, this is like an inspiration we draw from a plasma cache. Uh, so basically every state is kind of having a pre-assigned address. Uh, and uh, you know, to, if you're interacting with your counterparty, you only need to monitor like a, uh, this much of data is uh, gonna be fine. And uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, if the, if Alice submit a state proof, uh, and uh, you know, she will wait for timeout, and if the timeout uh, passes, uh, she will start a one-bit claim challenge with a monetization bound. And uh, Bob, if uh, responded to that challenge with also a monetization bound, what's going to happen is that Alice can actually have the state availability attestation from the uh, you know uh, state guardian network, and then Bob will lose the challenge. And if Alice here is malicious, what's going to happen is that Alice will submit a state proof, and Bob will actually respond to the state proof before the timeout actually expires. So that is kind of a very, very quick summary about state guardian network. And uh, uh, you know, another kind of a challenge uh, uh, in the uh, state channel network is network liquidity. So in state channel network, what, what we envision in the future, the state channel network is going to look like this. This is going to be a multi-hub uh, network basically. Uh, you have a hub that is connecting to a lot of end users and then the hubs are connected together. Now if we zoom in and look at each of the hub, uh, you know, because uh, each of the hub when trying to relay some payment in a trust-free way also need to have some corresponding channel deposit to each of the state channel. So what's going to happen is that the OSP, the off-chain service provider here, is going to run out of money very, very fast. So the problem in, the, in our current crypto space is that people have money, may not have the engineer capability or interest, interest to run this stuff. 
and people who has engineer capability to run and operate an off-chain service provider may not have the required capital to s serve these kind of large amount of users. So what's going to result, uh, you know, uh, the result is going to be slow adoption and also uh, very quickly centralization of this entire network. Only like whales can run this stuff. So we introduced uh, uh, two solutions to act as a combined solution for the network liquidity uh, challenge. The first is called proof of liquidity commitment mining, the first part. Um, so the proof of liquidity commitment mining is to incentivize this, the entire network to create a very abundant and a stable liquidity pool for a certain network. So uh, it works basically like a virtual mining process where you have two liquidity backers here. One is waiting to lock up 10 ETH for three years for nothing to back, but back a certain network, and the other is uh, 30 ETH for two years. Now, their virtual mining power becomes uh, um, this. So basically a multiplier between these two things. And the newly generated seller token will be awarded proportionally to their virtual mining power. So with this incentive, and also because of the seller network's uh, you know, uh, income flow earning power, so they become a very positive incentive to, especially in the beginning, create a very stable and abundant liquidity pool for the entire network to operate. Now we, we have the pool of liquidity. We have the pool of money sitting here. How do we use that? Right? So we created something called a liquidity backing option. Let's say this guy is some like, technology savvy guy that wants to run an off-chain service but does not have the uh, liquidity required to do that. Now what he can do is that he can start, start an auction contract on the blockchain directly saying that I need 100 ETH for 30 days with maximum supportable interest rate of 1%. And then all these liquidity backers will be eligible to bid on this contract saying that, okay, I'm willing to lend you for 0.5% interest rate. Uh, some other guy is going to say, oh, I'm waiting to lend you for 1% in interest rate. And some other guy is also going to say, oh, 0.5% interest rate. But the difference between these two bids are this first bid actually is also at the same time saying that uh, I'm willing to stake 20 uh, set, uh, seller token as kind of my priority note. So seller token now here become uh, also, um, a seller token here also serves as an additional functionality of priority determination between different bids. Um, so that becomes like, a, you know, basically if you have more seller token, statistically speaking, you will have more chances to be, back, to, to be used as a backing asset and therefore earning more interest rate. So, uh, you know, uh, then we take the second score auction. That's kind of some detail. So now this is like a, a, the C economic construct that we proposed. Uh, if you really think about this, it completes the circle of off-chain economic design, right? Because the liquidity backing auction and the proof of liquidity committed mining process is to ensure that we can easily bring on-chain state to the off-chain world because we solve this kind of liquidity shortage problem. And then the state guardian network is here to ensure that we never need it. We can actually bring the off-chain state back to on-chain. So it's kind of a complete the entire circle uh, of the crypto economics uh, incentive design. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of like a quick, in, uh, quick, uh, quick uh, introduction about our uh, economic construct as well. Yeah. All right. So any questions? And yeah, so what, one interesting thing is like we have a, uh, we have a lot of uh, Korean users. I'm not sure like if there's any, you know, uh, one sitting in the crowd that actually used the Stellar X application. But uh, you know, uh, Korean users actually rank the number four uh, in our like global user count uh, rank. And uh, you know, the first one is uh, uh, you know United States. The second is China. Guess what? Who is third? Japan. Yeah. Any any more guesses? Sorry? Brazil? Brazil? Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, Brazil, we have some users, but like not on the top 10, though. We, we want to try to get, get some more Brazil users. Um, it's actually United Kingdom, which surprised me as well. So, uh, you know. Okay. Question? Yeah. yeah um, one question for me is that um, in order to develop some seller based on applications, right. what kinds of develop knowledge? Great question. Let me switch to that slide. So I actually carried a 140 page slide today. Uh, so, you know, whatever the question you guys ask, I can find the answer here. 
Okay, so this is, this is the stuff. Um, you know, uh, basically, uh, we, are, we are blockchain agnostic, so you can, uh, you know, uh, develop on Solidity directly. Now, what, what it means to develop a, a generalized state channel application is to write a smart contract that conform to certain interfaces. So basically, you need to write a smart contract with uh, these kind of uh, data, data, uh, data, data member, and imp implementing these kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 functions basically to to validate the state increment, um, to you know generate new state, uh, and basically to sign new states. So these kind of functions are uh, needed there uh, to implement a, a uh, generalized state channel application basically. Yeah. Uh, one more, one more yeah. I saw that you are attached to many mainnet, right? That's right. Including the Ethereum and the other stuff. So, the, all of the main, main Ether, no, no, all of the blockchains are supporting these functions, right? So, no. So, it means that, that every blockchain that you are attached to should support the Ethereum company, right? No? Uh, yes. Uh, or, or sort of, basically. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are uh, some things that I can. Um, you know, uh, some of these can be supported with uh, uh, a more limited scripting language. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a project recently we, we have been talking to is like called Chia, um, and uh, they support like relatively limited set of uh, stuff, uh, but already much more broader than uh, what Bitcoin can support right now. Uh, so some of these functionality they can support, but not. Uh, to the point that you can actually support all sorts of games and uh, you know uh, financial derivative market and stuff like that. It's more it's more focused on payment or optimize the payment micro payment use cases basically. Yeah. And then we're gonna like get some questions from the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question on the uh, state guardian network as a solution to. State uh, availability problem. That's right. Uh, uh, forgive me for my ignorance, but if if the user can challenge a malicious attacker after the attack has happened, why do we need uh, the state guardian network in the first place? So the question is like, uh, you know, you, what, what if uh, the user, because the user can actually challenge the uh, malicious uh, behavior, so what, why do we need state guardian uh, network? So. Uh, the reason is that uh, you know for the for a user to be able to do the challenge, uh, that user need to be first of all always online, because he need to be able to see all the all the all the states being proposed or being posted uh, on the basically uh, you know uh, on the on the relevant contract, and then he needs to always look at what is going on in terms of the blockchain uh, blockchain transactions. Right, so you need to be online and you need to be constantly downloading blogs, basically. And that is, uh, is a very unrealistic assumption for uh, the end users because the end users probably won't be online all the time. And also, you know, if you're running like cellular connections, you probably don't want to keep downloading blogs uh, to monitor what ha what's happening uh, in the, um, uh, 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 you know, in, in the re relevant potential dispute contract that you have. Uh, so that is like the key reason why we need to introduce uh, uh, state guardian network to guard the uh, you know state when users are actually not always online. But uh, if if user can challenge uh, a malicious attacker among the uh, guardian network, uh, isn't that assuming that user is always online to uh, observe the goings of? Network as well? Great question. So you know, uh, th there is also this construct where uh, user later comes back online and say that oh look, you didn't do the job. So the state guardian network, the staking process is actually a much longer, uh, you know, exiting and uh, you know, uh, uh, committing process comparing to the actual state channels tearing down and establishing time. Uh, so basically, let's say you are state guardian. Once you stake your seller token into the state guardian. 
if you want to withdraw, it's not going to be instant withdraal. It's going to be a very, very long, very, very tedious challenging period until you can actually withdraw your Seller token out of the system. So it's just like the proof of stake. It's, it's somewhat like the proof of stake system uh, where like, a, you know, um, yeah, it, to prevent this kind of a long range attack basically. But for the normal applications, when they're creating state channel, we don't want the timeout to be so long because that will create another uh, you know, uh, area of attack that is like basically you can easily lock up someone else's liquidity for a very long time. Um, so that is like the trade-off there. Basically, we shift the time locking period to the people who are actually earning uh, insurance fees who are basically the state guardian network. That, that I think is a great question. And this is something that we are like actively simulating and also doing research on. Uh, now, uh, you know, however, from a principal point of view, um, this is a, the entire state guardian network is driven by, uh, you know, uh, basically profit uh, and like, uh, you know, demand and balances basically. So let's say there are only one state guardian to start with. So everyone's payment is gonna go to that state guardian, right? So now this guardian is making all the money in the world basically. Now there are gonna be then, you know, in that sense, like, uh, you know, as long as uh, this state guardian's margin is positive, uh, there will be more state guardians joining the network to split the margin. So now basically, you know, uh, we, what we can see is that um, as the network grows, uh, the number of state guardians actually gonna grow, corresponding to the network. Now what is, uh, uh, is, there, is there gonna be a minimal number of state guardian required to guard the state? Uh, we think yes. Uh, there, there has to be a minimal number of a state guardian guarding the state, otherwise like the collusion mechanism doesn't work and stuff like that. Um, but that. But that part we're still like doing uh, active research and uh, doing some experimentation, uh, experimentation on basically. Uh, and in terms of attacks, uh, it's, it's actually quite hard to uh, attack state guardians um, because uh, you know, for state guardians, uh, uh, let's say that uh, you know, if you want to launch a DDoS attack, it's actually not viable. Um, because you actually do not necessarily know the endpoint of the state guardian, right? So, um, you know, uh, the state guardian can be like anywhere in the network because you, you don't know who, which, like which, basically which server is holding which key. Uh, even if you like attack, like you, you concentrate the traffic to a certain server, that, that server's key can be well, very well existing in many other places. Um, so in terms of that, like the, the attack scenario is actually, you know, um, relatively less of a concern. Yeah. Um, is, uh, one more question would be, is there any way to perhaps um, force state channel users to themselves also have the role of being um, a, 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 a settlement provider arbiter? So like you spread out that responsibility throughout the network, um, perhaps not necessarily on permanently, but on a certain time basis. And um, that, that's, that's something interesting that we, we need to explore, um, you know, uh, but uh, the, the design, like purpose or design principle is to kind of not let the end users who are like you and me uh, take the responsibility of monitoring the blocks and monitoring the stuff and then submitting the uh, the state. So it's more towards like a that um, it's it's sort of like a validator set for uh, you know a proof of stake chains and stuff like that. So it's more dedicated infrastructure to do this stuff. Yeah. Thank Next. you. Well, that's for the 
your presentation. Yeah. Um, I've got a uh, few questions. The first is like absolute necessity of tokens. So can you give us the uh, justification why you sell tokens? Yeah. Because like, there has been a lot of dispute regarding the necessity of tokens recently. There's a fire to lose on the bank board. It's like major change to this stuff. So yeah, first, why do you need it? Why do you need to sell tokens? That's my first question. Um, and the second question is like, because uh, you are implementing your network in different sort of like cross blockchain. That's right. So mm -hmm. in that case, how your token can be sort of like managed and maintained, like cross blockchain. And probably <coughs> that's my second question. The third one is like, if you can share what kind of like applications um, can be built on top of a uh, seller mm -hmm. that will have the most immediate impact. In terms of like yeah. So if you can share your Yeah. Cool. Uh, great. So first question. First, uh, why why token? Like where are evil guys raised a bunch of money? You know, why is a token? No. So I'm kidding. So um, you know, um, the the reason for a token is first and foremost, uh, um, you know, uh, support this kind of a crypto economic construct, uh, which is uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to provide enough liquidity and uh, incentivize abundant and stable liquidity pool for the network, and also provide this kind of incentive uh, uh, compatible, uh, you know, securing layer or insurancing layer for this entire network. Now, um, you know, it's not to say that there aren't other ways to do this kind of a watchtower services. There are actually, but what we believe is that, you know, uh, as shown like later in the slide somewhere, um, you know, uh, there, these mechanisms are actually not uh, as optimal as the solution that we propose because um, you know the solution of the state guardian proposed very very simple uh, you know uh, state state guarding interface uh, very simple one way uh, price dynamics that you can basically choose your own price uh, while you're looking at this network to to see how secure you want your state to be, and you don't even need to tell and negotiate with any of the state guardians. And uh, you know, we use this kind of side chain construct to have the reliable attribution of the history. So all these things combined uh, is uh, you know contributing to or like basically uh, designed towards uh, uh, a token-based system. So there are a lot of tokens that does not make any sense. Uh, for example, the tokens that are used merely as a medium for payment. In, the, in, in a certain platform, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, I guess this is like a, the community consensus already, these kind of tokens that don't make sense. But the, the, the class of tokens that, that people are thinking that does make sense is a token that is acting as kind of a, a work authorization or work token, that if you have the token, you can do the work, you earn income, and more importantly, as the network grow more and more popular and or the network has more and more transactions on it, um, the fundamental anchoring value of the token also increases because, for example, in Seller's case, uh, you know, a, a, a proportion of the transaction fees is going to effectively be split to the uh, Seller token holders, the State Guardian network, and therefore, you know, uh, the more people are using the network, the more service fees the State Guardian network will, is going to get, and therefore, the uh, you know higher value, the higher fundamental value, uh, the, the Seller token will be, like from the economic <coughs> point of view, basically. Um, uh, so the second question is, uh, sorry, I forgot the second question. Uh, yeah. So how do you ensure that you take the for sort of like Oh yeah, so, so via, yes, via, via, via cross-chain bridges. So, uh, you know, th there are various different ways to implement the cross-chain bridges. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, basically we're going to do that stuff. And uh, the third question I think is a very good one, that is what is the immediate viable business model that can be built on top of Setter? Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're gonna release uh, something called Setter X, which is a scale-based real cash gaming platform um, so that you can build this kind of a trust-free interactive games on top of a, a state channel and also uh, have the, the uh, developers or the operators of the network directly harvest the transaction fee from an extremely large amount of transaction volume. So that becomes a very sustainable path for the developers to gain, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, revenue. Uh, even if uh, the developers do not want to like host a node themselves, we can host that node and at the same time, like basically split some of the transaction fee for the to the developers who build these applications. Uh, but we do believe that gaming will be the Trojan horse um, of uh, blockchain to mass adoption. Uh, you know, we are already seeing that 
even with a, a very, very simple dumb game that we built like uh, on the test net. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of layer two solutions like to set sort of like trade off. Right. So but there are more than like fifteen different sort of pop and pop. That's right. Sure, yeah. Right? And they have all different trade offs. So I think so how do you decide on what kind of like trade off they want to make? And mm -hmm. is there any governance aspect it's like to your system? So, uh, you know, I think this is a, uh, also a great question. So what is the trade-off? So in general, we are currently writing on generalized state channel solution. So generalized state channel solution comes with inherent caveats and trade-offs. So, um, you know, uh, first thing is that uh, it does not support a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the case where, like, it's an open platform, that where, like, an application is entirely open. For example, CryptoKitty cannot be accelerated by generalized state channel. Um, you know, uh, and also it comes with a caveat of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of always online problem, and also uh, the uh, uh, the liquidity shortage problem. But these two problems we solved using uh, the, uh, you know, seller token-based crypto economic constructs. So basically that's kind of like, a, you know, how we're, how we're looking at it. Uh, but in, in, in a more broader sense, uh, in a broader sense, uh, you know, uh, we do think that this kind of a trade graph curve need to be continuous somehow. Um, and uh, currently the trade off curve is very, very discrete. You either have side chain, which is like sitting here, uh, and then you have state channel, which is sitting there. Um, and, you know, uh, b between them, we think there are like, uh, you know, ways to connect them as a continuous trade off curve. Uh, that's something that we are uh, actively exploring. Yeah, real cash gaming. Yeah. Real cash gaming. Right? Yeah. So that lies into the under the jurisdiction of law. So I'm um, just asking you a question regarding. So Koreans love to gamble. So a lot of our parents, <laughs> a lot of friends, play gamble of online yeah. games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's legit games. I'm not talking about like random sites. I'm yeah. Talking about the websites like Hunt Game. Right. Um, and those are just digital app, digital digital points. But will we eventually see uh, cryptocurrency being implemented there? or do we need a legal or uh, statement from the government to implement this program? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, uh, you know, we, we have some legal counsel in the states uh, that we have some uh, pretty clear, uh, pretty good clarity in terms of what we can and cannot do there. And, uh, you know, the good news is that we can do a lot of stuff, um, you know, in the, in, in the United States, as long as it's not, it's not a gamble, as long as it's a, a skill-based game. Um, you know, the market is also growing, growing rapidly, um, you know, uh, one, one company that does this uh, uh, is uh, harvesting about 400 million running run revenue by the end of last year. Um, now, the interesting thing there is that the biggest cost is actually payment cost uh, for the traditional industry. So blockchain solved that exactly, solved that precisely that problem. Um, and uh, you know, also the seller's layer two scaling architecture is allowing this kind of instant interaction, which is like very much needed if we want to build any sort of uh, uh, good user experience based games. Uh, so that I think is uh, you know, uh, something interesting. Now, in terms of the global scale, like we, we, we show that we have, uh, we, we have users from 88 different countries. Now, the legal aspect is something that is extremely interesting to us. Um, you know, I'm actually like talking with a Korean local lawyer tomorrow uh, about this, like how, to what extent we can operate here. And, uh, you know, but the bottom line is that we're not, definitely not going to break law and uh, because I don't want to go to jail. So, yeah. All right. Okay, I guess. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, feel free to. Uh, oh, by the way, my, my I, I have a cacao talk. So, you know, feel yeah. free to, you know, add me and, uh, you know, whatever. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.